Okay, uh, so I think we can begin now. Uh, before we start, I just want to let you all know that this session is being recorded. So if you are comfortable in being in the recording of the session, you can keep your videos on. And when we move to the Q&A, you can raise your hand and ask your question directly to the speaker. If you are not comfortable in being in the recording of the session, then you can keep your videos off. And when we move to the Q&A, you can put your questions in chat or you can send it as a DM to either me or today's speaker. And we'd be happy to take it up anonymously. Um, please keep your um, selves on mute while uh, we go over the presentation, um, just so there's um, no disruption. Uh, so with that, uh, we begin today's workshop on the Aga Khan Foundation International Scholarship Program. Um, very quickly, I'll give you an outline of what we're going to be doing today. So I'll uh, introduce you to Project EDU Access and to your panelists for the day, who will then take over and give you an overview of the scholarship, tell you a little bit about the eligibility criteria, the application process, what happens after selection, um, what is the disbursement process like, give you some general tips on your application, uh, speak to you a bit about some application components, and then we move to the Q&A. Um, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are Project Edu Access. We believe that access to higher education, leadership, and professional opportunities is a privilege that most people from marginalized communities are systematically denied through cost, information, and dispositional barriers. Um, so we um, try to improve inclusivity in these spaces by removing some of these barriers for marginalized communities in the global south. Uh, we do this by providing mentorship, engaging in advocacy, um, running capacity building workshops, both online and in person. And today's workshop is a part of our series of workshops that we've been conducting over um, the past year on uh, various scholarship opportunities to pursue higher education abroad. Uh, so. Uh, to do this today, we have with us a wonderful panelist. We have with us Burhan, who did their master's in structural engineering, mechanics, and materials from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, on the Aga Khan um, scholarship. Um, thank you so much, Burhan, for joining us today and uh, speaking to everyone about the scholarship. I will hand it over to you now. All right. Uh, thanks again, Elizabeth. Um, thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, I hope after today's session, so we all um, answer a number of questions that the applicants might have for the, um, for the scholarship. All right, let's get into it I, without any further ado. Um, so firstly, we wanna like talk about what the scholarship is, um, talk about some features of the scholarship, and then we'll get into what are the eligibility criteria, um, are there any preferred candidates um, who can or who cannot apply? Um, so the scholarship is um, awarded by the Al Khan Foundation, um, and they are a um, global organization that focuses on different humanitarian um, areas, so be it education, agriculture, um, and all that good stuff. Um, and in the field of education, the Al Khan Scholarship has been um, quite generous that they uh, sponsor uh, candidates from uh, different developing countries. So I believe as of now, it's like 18 countries where um, people can apply for higher education. Um, some key things to keep in mind is that the scholarship is only uh, applicable for people who are going for a master's or a PhD. Um, and this is gonna be a half grant and half loan scholarship. So that would mean like whatever amount you are awarded, you would have to pay back 50% after you graduate or um, we can get, get that into get into that later but half of that is gonna be a grant. So you don't have to pay half of that um, amount back. And as for the duration of the scholarship, um, if you're a master's student, you're gonna be funded throughout your program, which is ideally gonna be two years. Um, and even though you're got, you are approved for the full two years or the full duration of your program, the Al Khan scholarship will have their annual renewal um, process. They will see whether or not they will continue Funding your um, funding your education into the next year, and as for PhDs, you will only be funded for the first two years, um, with the intent that you will find alternate scholarships, be to different, um, be to any um, of your university's own programs or any other research projects. 
And this scholarship is essentially for the students' uh, expenses related to education, so tuition fee. It could be that you may need some, uh, somebody could be buying some books, um, any, any laptop that may help in your education. And you can also pay, uh, use the app on the award for your living expenses. But in case you have a, uh, somebody else accompanying you, you cannot use the you cannot use the scholarship for their expenses. So you got to keep that in mind in case you have somebody accompanying you. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so with a general overview of the scholarship, um, let's see like who can apply to the to the scholarship. As I mentioned earlier, there are some countries um, from which applicants are accepted. So uh, this year um, you have all the countries that are eligible. I'm highlighting Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan. I guess that's where most of our uh, audience would be from. Um, but yeah, you can look at if you are in one of those countries, from one of those countries. For the countries on the far right in the in the last column, uh, you can be someone who is residing in these countries, but you must have an original link to the countries on the on the left two columns. Uh, some other uh, requirements for the for the to be eligible for the uh, award is that you need to have completed your high school. You must have a bachelor's degree in hand. Um, this is an <clears throat> I guess this is an important distinction uh, with with other scholarship is that you need to have your bachelor's degree in hand for the Aga Khan scholarship. If you are in your final year, you do not have your um, you haven't completed your degree, you are ineligible. So um, please keep that in mind. And uh, again, this scholarship is only for master's and PhD programs. If you have, if you're admitted to a program, which is um, say part-time, you are again ineligible. Um, and bear in mind, uh, they do not want you to rely solely on Aga Khan scholarship as a source of your funding, um, you must, apply to other other means. I've had it applied for other funding um, because this doesn't mean that you need to have secured other um, other financial aid. It, it could just be that you applied, you're awaiting the decision. Um, so yeah, you have to like explore other means of um, funding for your program. All right, let's go over to the next slide. Uh, I think like before we get to the next slide, maybe just back up a bit. So in the bottom right corner, um, there's that accessibility tool, which you can find on their website. So in case you are not sure whether or not you're eligible for the scholarship, you can just go on the Google, type in Aga Khan ISP. It'll um, bring you to their website. And on, on the website, you'll find this accessibility tool. And this is gonna really simplify uh, in checking whether or not you're eligible. You just click on that tool. It'll ask you a couple of questions, what country you're from, um, where your program is, whether it's a full-time or a part-time program. So it'll basically ask you all of these questions that we uh, all, um, that we talked about here, and then it'll tell you whether or not you're eligible to apply for the scholarship. All right, uh, heading over. So these were the basic eligibility criteria. Some other things to keep in mind is, um, so even though they, they um, accept applicants for both masters or, and PhDs, uh, they do prefer master's candidates. Uh, why that is, I have no idea, but that's the way things are. Um, the other um, preferences for young professionals, somebody who is under the age of 30. And finally, if you have secured uh, alternate sources of funding, what that would mean is you are asking essentially a lesser amount from Aga Khan. Um, these three are Preferences, that doesn't mean that you are ineligible if you don't meet any of these three uh, three pointers. I myself, even though I was awarded the scholarship, I did not have any alternate funding. I was relying on Aga Khan scholarship purely with some uh, personal contributions. Uh, yeah, so I think what also would make you ineligible, um, but these things, um, the first point is if, you if your program is gonna be in the UK or Russia, and this changes from year to year. I remember when I applied back in 21, 22, um, you had, I think, a couple of more countries uh, in there. So if you if you studied, for example, Germany, or if you were gonna be studying in the Netherlands, um, the UK, uh, you would be ineligible back in 2021. But clearly this year, it's only UK and Russia. So if you're applying, let's say next year, you should again check whether or not they have changed these uh, countries. 
And as I said earlier, the, the program is only, the, the scholarship is only for master's and PhD and that too full-time. So be sure your program is not a short-term or a part-time course. And finally, if your um, program has already commenced, you're already studying um, your program, you cannot apply for the scholarship because what that essentially means is you have, you have enough funding. That's why you, you started your course. Um, and that would make you ineligible for the scholarship. So again, these all of these pointers are covered by uh, the accessibility tool on their website. You can just head over there, check whether or not you're uh, eligible, and that's gonna solve a lot of headache trying to figure out whether or not you should apply to the scholarship. All right. <clears throat> so uh, we have a general idea of what the scholarship is. We know what makes you ineligible and what makes you ineligible. Uh, let's look at like what the overall application process looks like with uh, regards to timeline uh, for the Indian candidates. I, I would assume it's gonna be similar for other uh, countries as well. Uh, but just bear in mind the timeline that I'm showing here is uh, from my personal experience. Um, yeah, so the, the first step would be to contact your local Aga Khan office in your country. Uh, sometime between early Jan to uh, early March, you'll, you'll email them. They will send, send out your application form. <clears throat> and between Jan to March, you'll be you know, basically filling out your application form, collecting your documents. And by the deadline, which is ideally, I would believe mid-March, it can be mid-March to late March, you will submit your application. Uh, it's gonna be a physical post in most cases where you're like physically sending in the documents in, in a physical mail. Um, so once you send out your documents uh, in, the, in, in by late March, from March to the, to basically they'll use a full month of April to shortlist candidates. They'll be going through the documents that were sent over by the candidates. They will select um, candidates for the second round. And the, by, the, by early, early May, you will know whether or not you, ha you have been selected for the interview and within the next 10 days. So that would be like mid-May-ish. You will have your interview, um, get selected for, uh, you know, get shortlisted after the interview. And then eventually you'll be submitting your application for the final round, which is going to be uh, an international round. So all the applicants from different countries would be um, assessed. You don't have to go there physically. It's just your applications are being sent over for a final um, selection process. So that's like your final round. That's going to be somewhere between um, June to July and ending Ju and early July or mid July, you will receive your um, selection, your, uh, your um, offer letter, hopefully. All right, uh, let's get into each of these round one, two, and threes uh, uh, one by one. So as I said, I think most of the people right now are in the <clears throat> are in round one phase where you guys are collecting your applications, filling in your forms, collecting your documents. Um, key things to keep in mind is remember what the deadline is. It's probably going to be that you have like send in your physical um, documents, your physical application in a, in a mail. So give plenty of time for that. Uh, don't rush, um, you know, don't wait for the last minute to send in your application. Um, that's gonna save you a lot of stress. Um, so yeah, to get the application, I, I would assume most of the people have already done this. You email, you get your application form, you fill in, you know, all the requir required documents. Um, I think some of the, these are pretty boilerplate, whether or not you're applying to Aga Khan or any other scholarship, you would be asked for these, you'd be asked for these um, uh, details in almost any scholarship form. But some of the key ones are that you need to have an offer letter uh, from a university that they are saying, hey, we are accepting this person for our academic program. You also need to send in your personal statement. You have to disclose your finances. Uh, how much your family is going to contribute to your study, have you received any extra funding, and last but not least, how much amount are you asking the scholarship to pay for your education, and they will basically ask you for the breakdown each year, how much do you want, it could be that the first year you want more, the second you want lesser, or however. Um, so once you submit your application by uh, late March, 
the results are declared in, in, in about a month. So by early May, you'll, you'll uh, be aware whether or not you're going to be making it to the second round. All right, let's head, head over to the second round, um, which is going to be the interview. Uh, Ms. Buck, can we switch the slide, please? All right. Um, so the last in the first round results are out in uh, early May. From early May to mid May, you will be um, instructed to prepare for the interview. And from each country, they shortlist roughly 80, 18 to 20 student uh, applicants. Um, I, I think that will give you an idea of how competitive it might be. Uh, but nonetheless, once you're shortlisted for the secondary interview, it's quite a relaxed interview, to be honest. You don't have to be you know, stressed about it as much because you've already passed a big filter. All they want to know is how you're, whether or not you are a good fit for the, for the scholarship and um, whether or not you're kind of the candidate that, that they're looking for. Um, they will also provide you before, before you um, come for your interview, they will provide you with some documents and some instructions regarding the interview. And they also disclose if they have some questions that they may ask you. So here are some of the questions that they generally ask, um, which is again, quite boilerplate. Um, why this university? Why do you wanna study this particular course? What's your family's financial situation? They may ask you questions on your resume, on your SOP, whether or not you have any relevant work experience and how that has prepared you for, um, how that has prepared you for your course of study. Um, and I, I think the two important things uh, in addition to these are, what are your long-term and short-term career plans and how they are relevant to the foundation's uh, area of focus. So you kind of have to like be prepared um, to convince the panel that what you're trying to study is essentially in line with the foundation's vision. Because again, as I said earlier, the foundation is focusing on education, healthcare, um, infrastructure development, and some other areas of focus in um, developing countries. So you, you should be clear um, you should you know, have it clear for yourself as well as make it clear to the panel that, hey, this is what I'm studying and this is how it's essentially gonna help out my country in the future or any other developing country for that matter. Um, and once you have your interview, it's gonna be pretty fast because it's just 20 people at max um, who are shortlisted. So the results will be declared within one to two days after the interview. Um, let's head over to the next round, which is gonna be the final round. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the interview round, which was in mid uh, mid May, uh, the results are declared one to two days after, which is again mid May. Um, from mid May to June, you'll be working with the same panel who had your interview. Uh, you'll be working with them to prepare your final application. Um, so you already sent your physical application in the first round, right? Um, they gen they scan those documents. They have a soft copy of your application. They may ask you for further documents. It could be that you um, mentioned that you did a particular extracurricular activity or you worked for a certain NGO, but you didn't supplement your application with a, with a supporting document. Um, what they may ask you is, do you have any proof for that? So if you have any missing documents, you know they will ask you in this round to make sure you're uh, application is uh, bulletproof, basically. So basically, they're trying to help you out and making a really, really strong case for you. So you're going to be working with them to compile the application. Oh, and previously, there were like 18 to 20 applicants who were shortlisted for the second round. For the final round, they're going to be shortlisting three to four candidates from each country. So these three to four candidates, their applications are prepared, and they're sent for the final round. Um, to be selected by the international panel in Geneva, Switzerland. That, that's where they meet annually once a year. Um, it could be that all, all of the applicants get selected. It's not one over the other. It could be that all four of them get selected or it could be just uh, the top one candidate gets selected. And the results are declared by mid-July. And yeah, let's head over. All right, so you got selected mid-July. 
congratulations, hooray. Uh, a lot of weight lifted off your shoulders. It's definitely gonna be a lot of stressful time starting from March to July. Um, but anyway, you got the award. You will receive an email with uh, the award letter and several other documents, bank forms, um, some terms and conditions. Uh, and to accept the, the offer, you're just gonna send over your passport, your guarantor's passport, and you're gonna sign this um, terms and conditions and send them back. So that's e easy as that. Um, let's head over to the next one. <clears throat> Um, so till now, um, you received the award and this is roughly around mid July, right? So most, ac most academic programs start in mid August. So you have roughly one month. Um, what you would be doing in this time is probably getting ready to travel. Um, so assuming you are in your country of study, you'll be asked to open up a new bank account, um, and share your details to the um, to the foundation. So whatever uh, amount you seek from the foundation for the first year would be dispersed in two installments. The first installment would be once you join, uh, once you join your uh, once you start your um, program. So that will be typically in August. And the second uh, second installment for the same year would be in early January. So that completes your basic, it's like your two semesters essentially. So when you're paying your first semester fee, that's your first installment. When you're gonna be paying your second um, semester fee, just before that you will receive your second installment. Um, and if you recall, I mentioned that for the masters, it's gonna be for the full duration of your program. That's, and for PhD, it's gonna, you're gonna be funded for this two years of your program. But um, the scholarship is, renewed annually. That would mean that you have to show satisfactory academic performance through your transcripts. They will look whether or not you are performing well. And uh, they will basically decide in June or July whether they will uh, disburse the remaining, um, remaining amount for the second academic year. So that's how like, the general disbursement process goes. You'll be in email communications with them. They are really, um, really good at replying um, and replying fast. So you should not be worried. Just be uh, clear in your communications. Um, don't wait for the deadline. Don't wait for your um, a week before your um, fee is due to ask them, hey, I, wanted, I want to, you know, would you guys be dispersing my amount for my fee? Give them plenty of time because you're not the only applicant that they're funding. So it's better to prepare beforehand and give them a timely notice of when you want the amounts to be dispersed. All right, let's head over. <clears throat> all right, so this was the whole application uh, overview and uh, leading all the way through selection and to the eventual disbursement of the funds. What are some general tips um, for the whole application process? Firstly, be aware of important dates and stay on top of things. I say this because you are not gonna be only um, working towards your scholarship um, application. Uh, you are <clears throat> also gonna be probably in communication with your university. They might have certain requirements uh, for you to come over to be able to study in a new country. So there's gonna be a lot of things happening parallelly. So you need to be really on top of things. You need to be aware how many things um, do I need to take care of? There's a scholarship aspect, there's a university aspect, there's probably visas. So different deadlines for different things. Be sure you're on top of things. Don't miss any deadline. Um, so look far ahead, try to plan well, try to plan efficient and you know start early, finish strong, that kind of uh, mentality. Um, the second tip, consider instructions, especially for SOPs. So if you look at your form, there's like, I think 60 or some 60 or 70 questions that they ask you. Each question has its instructions. Be sure when you're filling out your answer that your answer is addressing the questions that they are asking. A lot of the times you have an answer in your mind, you just plop it in. But then when you read the question, you should read it and make sure that your question is addressing 
what they are asking. Yeah, similarly for SOPs, they have certain points that they want to ask, such as um, why are you studying this program? How is this program in line with Aga Khan's um, areas of focus? So again, make sure that you're answering those points. Otherwise, you're just filling in an answer, but is that really what they are asking? So yeah, go by the instructions. That's a really crucial tip when filling out your form. Um, communicate well with your local office. You know, it's an application process. Things don't go always ideally. Uh, if something is bothering you, email them, write to them. And again, give them enough time to communicate back to you. Don't wait for the last hour. Um, so yeah, be be efficient, you know, give them time and be a good communicator overall. Uh, <clears throat> some tips during the interview. Um, I would say dress well. That was the number one tip because um, when I did the interview, I was dressed quite formally. Um, and even they were taken a bit aback, asking me that it was not required. But I think what I said was I wanted I want to give my 100% in everything. I don't know why I came up with that. But they were impressed with that. And I could see, and that put me at, at an ease. So dress well, be confident, um, exude confidence. You know. If you are confident, they are, you know, I guess more um, trusting as well. So what, whatever you're going to say, if you're confident, it lands well. Um, are we paused by any chance, Ms. Ma? Um, I don't think so. Okay, um, no worries. I think somebody posted, like, are we paused? Yeah. Cool. Um, don't memorize answers um, for the interview. Uh, as I said earlier, they're gonna be sending over a couple of questions that they may ask, such as um, why, why are you studying this universe? Why are you studying for this course? What, how is this gonna help your um, country of residence? Don't memorize answers. Definitely write them down. Try like, as you're thinking about these questions, you know, take a notepad, write down whatever you think is relevant go over those points again and again to get an idea of like how you need to answer the question. Don't memorize it word by word. I've seen somebody appear for an interview, not the scholarship interview, something else. It was a job interview, but they were basically memorizing the answers and then going into the interview, having those answers memorized. And when you speak with something that's memorized, you often come off, um, in an unnatural way. So you can easily tell whether or not somebody has memorized an answer. So I would really advise against against that. Definitely you know, write the answers down when you're thinking about the answers, try to understand what are the key points that you wanna um, get across to the, to the panel. So that, that's really important. Like think about what are the key things you wanna tell to the panel. All right, <clears throat> compile supporting documents early, yeah. Um, so there's going to be a whole lot of documents that you have to compile. Uh, and I guess like, given that we are only seven days roughly away from the deadline, most of you have already done this. Whatever you're writing on your application in your SOP, make sure you have something to back it up with. Um, you could say that I was working in an NGO in a remote village that nobody knows. Make sure you, you have, um, a document that goes along with it that says, hey, this guy was here. Hey, this girl was here. Um, so yeah, whatever you're writing on your application, make sure you have compiling docs, which means in some cases you don't have those documents. So you would have to contact people um, and have them prepare those documents, have them sign those uh, documents. So that may take some time, right? So give yourself, give yourself enough time. Don't wait for the deadline. Um, again, start early um, and finish strong. All right, <clears throat> those were some general tips. All right, so guys, there's a, there are some um, additional topics that we can get into. Some uh, topics such as what are the focus areas of Aga Khan? As I say again and again, they may ask you, how is your course of study in line with our focus area? So some people may ask, what are their focus areas? So we can get into that. We can also talk about what are the supporting documents that go along with your application. Um, we can talk about what's your 
how to write your personal statement. We can talk about what are, what are some alternate fundings, what are some good ways to fill out your financial need analysis form. And we can also talk about loan repayment. Um, yeah, I think before you open up for Q and A's, let's go to supporting documents and personal statements. Cool. So the snippet on the right side is actually from my own form when I submitted. Um, so basically this is the, I think first or the second page that goes along with your application. And you will basically check all the documents that you are um, submitting with your application. So pretty boilerplate, um, except for three thing, three or four things that I've highlighted here in yellow. Um, what you need is an official university cost estimate. Generally, this is not that something that you can get right away. Like it's not something on the web. It is on the website, but it needs to be official. So you would have to like contact your university where you're going to be studying. Tell them, hey, I'm applying for a scholarship. Um, would you be kind enough to provide me a cost estimate? Um, so that's going to be something that you have to um, talk, communicate with your university. What are some language and standardized tests that you apply? So it, this is basically your GRE, your TOEFL, your ALT. So <clears throat> uh, you, you have like some of those um, with your applications as well. We have three letters of recommendations. So at least one should be from uh, somebody who, who knows you from academia and at least one from your industry. And as for the industry, um, you don't necessarily have to be working full-time. It could be that you intern somewhere um, and it was a substantial amount of um, time that you spend there. You spend there a couple of months. So even they could be somebody that can, that can write your LOR. And if you have any um, external funding, so it could be your university is saying, we are offering you an assistantship. So that could be one form of external funding. It could be that you won another scholarship. That could be an external funding. Uh, and if you see in my case, the last two bullets, um, Cool. Um, so if you see in the last two bullets, I did not have any award from any other scholarship. So that's not something that's mandatory to keep in mind. So those are some supporting documents. We can talk about what are the things to keep in mind when writing your SOP. Um, and then we can maybe get into more detail if you have guys have any more questions. All right. So rather than writing my own points, I decided to like, um, cut this from the form itself. So again, as I was saying earlier, focus on um, the instructions in the form. So as I've highlighted here, they're asking you uh, why and how did you even decide to pursue this particular program, this particular university, um, and how um, you know are you and how, how is this education gonna help your career goal? And eventually what's this whole education and the scholarship gonna mean at the end of it? Like what, what, what is it gonna lead to at the end of it? Is it gonna be something that's in line with the Aya Khan's um, focus? So, you know, focus on these points, honestly, there's nothing um, too difficult to understand. I think, one thing that I've noticed is people, when they apply for universities, you know, they already have an SOP. And when they're applying for a scholarship, they generally take that same SOP, move things here around here and there, and then just copy paste it over for the scholarship. And what that does is you, you are, that, that SOP is basically targeted for a particular university and not for the scholarship. So make sure if you're doing that, that you change your SOP enough that you that you are addressing these points um, points a b c d that are mentioned here um, I think that's about it honestly uh, it's nothing that's too complicated you know but give yourself enough time SOPs can be a pain to write it, I think it took me two months to write mine I had like one draft then you like refine it you refine it again and again um, yeah take, take give yourself enough time um, but I hope that everybody here who's applying has um, are at a good spot 
because it's like only a five or six days that you guys have left. All right, um, I think that's about it. We can open up for Q and A's and then go into more deeper. Um, we can dive deeper as needed. Okay, thank you so much, Buran. That was really comprehensive. Um, so I think we can now move to the Q&A. There's already a bunch of questions in chat. Um, so maybe we can start taking those. And if people want to raise their hand and ask their question directly, um, you can do that as well. Uh, so actually, I'm going to club the first question because there's quite a few asking about the GPA requirement. So I think you mentioned that... Um, uh, like the minimum requirement of no that a four GPA is required. So I think uh, just what that means. Um, if you are um graded on a percentage yes. or on a ten GPA scale, and is how yeah. strict is the um grade requirement for the application? Um, so on their website, they mentioned that it needs to be at least 80% and they have, I believe it was 3.2 out of four, um, for if you're graded on a four scale. Um, but again, there's like different ways that you can be graded, right? It could be you're graded on a 10 scale. It could be, your, even though you're graded on a four scale, it could be, um, it could be, you know, curve adjusted or not. So to be honest, there's like multiple ways uh, to be graded. What I'll say is don't be held back. Uh, if you are, you know, right around that cost of 80% plus and minus, you should still apply. Uh, it could be that, you know, maybe you're lacking um, in that aspect, but then there's like the other aspects of your profile, which outshine this one particular point. Um, I would say, again, none of these, um, criteria are as hard and fast or set in stone. But something that is set in stone is that you need to have an offer, um, you need to have your bachelor's degree in hand. Those things are probably much more stringent. Um, but yeah, I would say 80% plus and minus is fine. And as for out of four, I believe on their website, it's um, 3.2 out of four. Um, if you have enough time, you can contact them um, that, hey, this is my particular um, uh, grading criteria. Do you think I'm eligible? But honestly, I would recommend applying nonetheless because I think they're saying, right, you miss all the shots that you don't take. So how would you know? Like if somebody says, okay, nah, you're not gonna, uh, you're not gonna be eligible. But then there's like a whole panel who's gonna look at your profile. So I would rather recommend that if you're not too, if you haven't like scored too poorly, uh, I would still recommend that you apply. Cool, I think um, next question. Yes, so um, I think there's uh, another set of questions that uh, relate to um, having an offer in hand while making an application. So do you need to have, uh, one is that you need to have an offer while you're making an application for the scholarship. And the second is that can you change um, um, the university that you've said that you've applied to for the scholarship? And I think another question was, um, can you mention multiple universities that you've received an offer from? And does that look bad on your application or reflect that um, you sort of haven't made a decision yet? Uh, I guess let's answer the second question. There, I believe that like on the form, you do mention what all universities you apply to and whether or not you received an offer. So they would already know because you let them know on the form, you filled out that particular question that these are the universities that I have admission from. But once you make pass for the first round, you really can't change the university. This is coming from personal experience. I wasn't even talking about like the university. I was just talking about the program. So you know how you can have a one-year program versus a two-year program. 
Sometimes people are admitted to a particular program and that has two tracks. One could be thesis based, which is probably two years, and one is non-thesis, which is one year. And I had filled out my filled out my application saying I'm gonna be doing a two-year program. Um, and you know, down the line, they asked me, um, are there any revisions? Um, and I was thinking like maybe should I I, I, I probably want to do one year program, same university, same course. It was just going to be rather than the second two year program, I'm going to be, be doing one year program. And I think they took it um, uh, not, not in the best way. They were like, no, 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 don't change it at all. Keep the form as is because you this is the form that we use to um, let you through the first gate, right? So if you enter the first gate, you probably, um, it'll be harder for you to kind of go back. Uh, and change it. Um, but again, apply based on your uh, current situation. It could be that you receive a much better university moving forward. Um, you would have like convey the the same to the to the um, to your, to the Aga Khan office. As I said earlier, they are really good at communicating. Let them know what's happening, and. Um, do what they tell you to do. Don't do your own thing because at the end of it, it's going to be, you're going to be signing papers. You're going to be, um, they're going to be transferring funds and they're going to be looking at whether or not it's the same university that you put on the application. It cannot be that you got awarded for, uh, you got awarded the scholarship for University A, but then you think of studying at University B. It's not going to make sense at the end of it because they're going to be checking where uh, you're paying the money so don't get things mixed up. Definitely get the, um, the Aga Khan committee involved in, in your decision-making. And the first question was whether or not we need to have an offer letter in hand. I think this is honestly not a question that I'm not 100% sure about. Um, if we go back to the appendix supporting documents, um, I guess the first or the second option that they mention is, yeah. All right. Let's look at option number. Wait, what's the third one? That says an official university um, cost estimate, and the second one would be a university admit letter. So based on these points, I would assume that you need to have these things in hand. Um, And if you also look at the eligibility tool on their website, they do say that, do you have an offer? Or I believe they ask like, are you gonna be studying? So it's like, it's almost a sure shot that you're gonna be studying there, that you're gonna receive a letter. Um, if you guys have an offer, you you know tack it onto your application. If you guys don't have an offer, it's either that you are ineligible or you can still apply. And I guess in that case, just go ahead and apply. Um, I guess that's my recommendation here. Or again, get in touch with the office because uh, the uh, the rules and regulation might be different for different countries. So it could be different for India, it could be different for Pakistan. So I would highly recommend get in touch with the office, ask them these questions, uh, let them know what your situation is. And hopefully you um, hear back from them in due time. If you don't, nonetheless, prepare yourself for, for applying to the, to the scholarship. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, before I come to the race and I'll ask another question that a bunch of people have been asking, which is, um, so, this is specific. Um, Columbia has set 15th April as the last day to submit a non-refundable fee in order to confirm my acceptance. Should I email them asking for an extension as I won't be sure about the scholarship at least till May? Do US universities entertain such requests? And there's a bunch of people that are asking similar questions on just um, the university timeline and the scholarship timeline. Yeah. Um... I mean, you would never know until you ask them, right? So it's either you don't ask them, uh, you don't uh, contact your university. I would recommend just, you know, let them know what's going on, that you guys are applying for a particular scholarship um, and you are awaiting decision. 
in most cases, they should listen to you. But again, if you don't ask, you would not know whether or not they're gonna um, extend that olive branch to you guys. So go ahead, ask them. Um, it's better that you ask them first rather than you know investing some amount in their, uh, but yeah, let's not go there. Yeah, definitely ask them and hopefully they, they you know extend that um, olive branch to you guys. Uh, Tarek, do you want to ask your question? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ba. And the session is going on. So it's so, uh, so uh, useful and interesting. And thank you so much. Uh, it's first time that I am hearing about this scholarship. So uh, a bunch of thanks to you and uh, Burhan. Uh, I, want, I want you to ask that uh, uh, I don't have offered letter yet. So uh, am I eligible to apply? And after that when you told me that uh, we can check the eligibility criteria on the website so i check it and it says that i have to email or uh, and uh, and keep in contact with the local uh, so uh, my my question is what we are supposed to write in the email and secondly i wanted just to make it uh, like uh, i was asking the question on a scale of four what is the minimum gpa required so i find it, found, found it out there on the website that it is minimum 3.2 uh it's all right thank you um yeah so i think the first step is uh, like when you go onto the eligibility tool you um answer the questions one of them being what's the uh, gpa requirement and as you rightly pointed out it's 3.2 um and at the end of like once you go through all the questions they say okay you are eligible here are some email that you need to contact so basically you write an email saying hey um, I'm interested in applying for the Aga Khan scholarship. Please let me know the further instructions. It's like a generic email kind of introducing yourself. And it's an auto, I think it's an auto generated email that will come back to you from the same address and that will have more instructions. So it's like you just call them, not call them, you email them. They will let you know like all the uh, other instructions. And generally uh, from my experience, they say, what degree and what program or what university you're going to be studying so that's the question that's what you're going to be answering them in that email and then they will send out your uh, application form in a pdf as a reply so you will fill the form eventually in the oh. that they send over got it got it thank you so much uh can i add something like uh is it like merit based or need based like what is the percentage of what is given more percentage like um by selection uh it is merit based or need based um i think one of the criteria of the scholarship is that you that everybody should be applying only when they need the scholarship so i think everybody is kind of in the same boat with regards like need, you have to prove that you actually need the scholarship. Um, and to be honest with you, I can't really tell like what their criteria is. Um, and from what happens in most cases is they look at the overall profile. It could be that you don't have as much need, but at the same time, you are, you have secured a really great admit uh, at, a, at a really prestigious university. On the other hand, it could be, um, you are at a good university, but at the same time, you do have a really high um, financial need. Um, but there are other factors as well, like how relevant your course of study is. So it's not just one criteria. You can't really boil it down to need versus merit. But again, um, one point that I highlighted earlier is they really prefer candidates who don't ask as much. Uh, for example, if you have application A, application B, A and B are almost exactly similar, only that A is asking more, B is asking less. They're gonna be preferring candidate B because candidate B is asking less. That leaves more funds with the committee to distribute among other students or for other cases. So I don't know if that answers your question, but the lesser you ask, the better your chances. So I guess that would be like somewhere close to the need based answer, but as much meritorious as you are, that's definitely going to be adding more. Um, that's going to be more favorable for you as well. I hope that answers the question, Tarek. 
जी थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच great um so i'm going to go back to the chat now for the remaining questions um i think some questions relate to um just eligibility i think on the the chat bot um on the portal says that they're not eligible and so um they're not able to uh, receive the form yeah uh i guess two things if you are really um ineligible for example if your program is in uk or russia so regardless you get the form you apply you are anyway going to be rejected unfortunately right because that goes against their um eligibility criteria um but there's a trick trick i wouldn't say like a tricky way to get the form if you really want to get the form answer all the questions such that you are eligible um and at the end of it you'll get the email but uh i i wonder whether that's going to be beneficial for you if you are ineligible in the first place that you still apply all right i think yeah um that's another question. question is um are the interviews virtual or in person from my experience it was uh virtual because um i applied in 2021 and that was around the time we had the covid restrictions i think it played out uh for for you know quite well for me uh that year but it could be that it, it's um i think from what i recall it might have been in person prior to that i don't know if it, if they are still continuing the uh online interviews again you will get to know that once you um uh, get to round 1 they will have all the instructions in there and you know you like you have plenty of time to prepare i think it's like 10 days by the time you receive your um, results of the first round and by the time you have your interview it's going to be like 2 weeks to prepare okay um another question is do we have to submit any documents to show our income or our family income the form doesn't mention adding any such document but is it asked at any stage yeah it's a good question really um on the form they don't have any requirements for supporting documents but once you're through your first uh, round in the interview they will um they will definitely ask you to expound on your financial um, situation they may ask the question you know that's going to be a verbal affirmation but once you're through the interview for the final application they will ask you for income tax returns so for example if your parents are earning if they're employed you will have to provide in i guess one or two years of income tax returns so that's one way where you're presenting your income yeah okay. um another question is is there a, is there any scope for them to select us but give us less than the amount that we asked for good question actually so um i was selected for the first round <clears throat> and when they kept <clears throat> sorry and when they called me for the second round they explicitly told me um that one of the criteria of getting selected even though it's not on the website is how much you ask right you could be a really good candidate but you were asking more so they let me um modify my application um so i was able to like kind of adjust the finances and ask a little lesser amount from the al khan scholarship but whatever final amount that you are approved for you are going to receive that amount nonetheless um so there is some room for adjustment if you are selected for the interview round so you may adjust your um finances a bit at that um at that particular stage but once you are selected once you get your award letter whatever amount is on that award letter you will definitely get that amount disbursed okay um another question is uh, what is the average grant amount um i can't tell mm, i can't tell because i don't have the information what i can tell you is what i had asked i believe i asked for 26000 um and office like 13 was disbursed in the first year another 13 would have been disbursed in the second year but i finished in one year so 
uh, kind of gave that second year's amount up. So I guess like um, per year, $15,000 is fine. Maybe 20 is fine as well. <clears throat> Uh, that's the only information that I have on the uh, amount, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, uh, another question is, is there a mandatory return to your homeland clause that comes with the scholarship? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> Short answer, there, there is no requirement. Um, but they do, they do want to know whether or not you have intentions, keyword intentions, right? It could be that... You go, let's say, to the U.S., you study there, you finish your program, but they, then you end up working for a couple of years, right? They did ask me, what, what are your plans? I said, being aware that they want us to work for, you know, marginalized countries. I said, I'm going to be studying there, and then I will work outside for a couple of years to gain good experience. So that's one way to put it. If you want to uh, work outside for a couple of years, and then eventually, once you're at a good spot, and in your professional career, um, you can come back with a with good experience, you know, um, to set up uh, your own business or um, any other way that you can help out your country. So yeah, there is no hard and fast uh, rule that you must come back. Great. Um... So there's a bunch of questions that I think we've already answered either through the PPT or through the Q&A. So I'm going to skip them. If you're still unclear about um, the answer and if you still want to ask your question, then you can raise your hand or put your question in chat. But I'm just I'm skipping a few questions. Um, another question is, does the rank of, a, of the university have any effect on um, the application that you make? So is it better to... Uh, show an offer from a university that's better ranked? I think this is a two-part question. Uh, does the reputation affect your um, overall chances? Yes, because they do mention on their website that uh, the sponsorship is for people going for higher education into reputable university, right? So that's your answer right there. Um, so there is preference to high reputable universities. Um, and the second question is, should you show um, a more reputable university or the other? I would recommend show the university that you want to go to because say you're showing a more reputable university, you get approved for that university, but you actually want to go for somebody, some, some other university that doesn't really work out for you well. Um, so yes, there is um, reference to high reputable universities, uh, but apply only for that particular university that you're going to study at. Great. Um, General, you raise your hand. Do you want to ask your question? All right. Thank you so much. Kindly confirm that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. Um, thank you so much for hosting this to give us the information on really applying around this Aga Khan scholarship. My questions are practically true, and they are a little bit um, not as in relation to broadly the application, but maybe what may happen if one of us is lucky and gets the scholarship. And that's maybe could you just highlight something around the repayment strategy? I mean, currently we are just reading, trying to get funding and all we are saying is 50-50 and it makes a lot of sense, but we'd want to get like from your experience, what does that look like? Is it fair? Is Could could we, of course, beyond the 50% um, scholarship, could we still pursue other loans and stuff? Is it fair rather than a loan? To just give us that idea while we go around that. And then um, my second question is in relation to AKDN activities, because my understanding is that this is an Aga Khan Foundation. And then in our personal statements, we have to somehow link the courses we want to do in the particular programs to the, to the, the things AKDN does. I just wanted to have a feel of what your experience was uh, based on the course that you did at UC Berkeley what how did you then we 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 vote that to just have a feel of what actually the actual experience is like thank you a uh, really good question gerald um let me uh get to the second question first so i think the second question was um when you're talking about what you are going to be working 
um, after you do your, after you finish your education, how how is that going to be in line with the AKDN's areas of focus? So, Ms. Boy, can you quickly bring up um, that one slide that talks about the focus areas? Um, as Ms. Boy is bringing those slide that slide up, um, so you really want to like think about what um, program that you're applying to and what are some possible job opportunities once you finish up your education. For me, it was uh, engineering, structural engineering. Um, so that's got to, that's got to do with um, the design of structures, right? Um, so once I identified where my job opportunities are, like what area my job opportunities are, I kind of link, um, I try to link where that lines up with the with the focus areas. So for me, it was civil society, right? You can see how building a resilient society links up with civil society. I also did my research on their website, seeing what kind of work has Aga Khan Foundation done um, with regards to civil society, with regards to infrastructure. Um, so that kind of gave me more idea of how I can link my job opportunities in the future after pursuing my program and how that's going to be, make me capable to you know, work in line with the Al Khan's area, area of focus. It doesn't mean I have to do it right away after finishing my master's. It could be that you know I gain good experience eventually once I come back or in, eventually once I'm in any other country, I can work towards building a resilient society. For example, for somebody in education, what they can say is, um, I'm going to be a great, um, you know, professional in my in my um, field, and once I gain enough skills, I'm going to come back, and you know, um, give back to the community. So that's like one way to think about how you can give back to the community. Think about these focus areas. Think about how your professional lines up with any one of these six main focus areas. Go onto the website, do more research. Like what kind of work have they done? Um, and kind of drive the point home, honestly, um, by doing more research and linking that to your job opportunities. Um, and the first question was, I think, more to do with uh, repayment and whether or not we can pursue alternate fundings. Let's look at slide number 21. So this is the financial need analysis. Um, herein, you fill out your expenses. And in the second row, or the second portion of the table, there is available and expended expected funding per academic year. So here in the third um, point is loans. So you can definitely fill in if you have any educational loan apart from the scholarship. You can also fill in if you have any other scholarships, be it any, you know, your university is partially funding you. It could be that you have an RA or a TA. So there's like a whole suite of other um, uh, other means of funding that you can add in here. Um, and as for the repayment process, let's go to the next slide that talks about the loan repayment. As I mentioned, it's a 50-50 um, um, scholarship. So it's like 50% grant that's gonna be gifted to you to have to like repay and the other 50 is a loan. And <clears throat> the loan starts accruing a 5% interest from the first day that you disperse the initial amount. That's Roughly, you know, when you join, the first amount is disbursed. That's when you the interest starts accruing. And once you graduate, so when do you pay back? You pay, you start paying back uh, the fifty percent um, six months after whenever the first thing happens. It's either that you graduate, or you decide that you don't want to pursue this course further, or the scholarship is withdrawn because unfortunately you were not able to meet the academic standards, or basically they do not renew your um, scholarship for the next year due to poor academic performance. So whatever happens earliest among all three of these, you will be given six months of moratorium. You don't have to do anything. Um, and after that time has elapsed, you will start, You uh, the Al Khan Foundation will get in touch with you. They will set up a repayment plan. And at max, it can be five years. So that's how like the general uh, repayment works. And it's quite easy. Uh, and you know, there's not a lot of fuss. You just, you know, they'll send over a form, you'll set up a payment plan. It could be a monthly payment plan, a quarterly payment plan, 
uh, a biannual plan, you know, you make two payments in a year, whatever works best for you. So that's how the overall loan repayment works. I hope I answered your question. So I think to summarize, yes, you can apply for other um, sources of funding, be it loan, be it other scholarships. And we just talked about how the overall repayment works. And the first question was about tying your job opportunity to the areas of focus, do more research on the Agacon website and see where you find strong correlation between your job opportunities and what the Agacon Foundation has been doing. I hope I answered your question. <clears throat> cool. Great. Um, I think, yeah, that would be helpful for others as well, since I think a few questions later related to what you covered. Um, mm -hmm. I So there's two questions that relate to the LOR. So the mm -hmm. first is, I don't have uh, any work experience. Can I use two academic references? Um, and then second is, again, is it mandatory to provide a professional recommendation letter? I haven't informed my current employer about my master's plan, so it might be difficult to get um, the, the LOR. Yeah. yeah, it's tricky, but um, honestly, it would be best if you were, were able to get, get a, a letter. Um, I hadn't, I didn't have any full-time work experience. What I did was um, get a letter of recommendation from a place where I interned. So that's one option. If you are hesitant in um, asking for an LOR from a current employer, maybe it could be, you know, somewhere you interned. And by internship, it could be even a research internship. Um, but yeah, um, I think a minimum one is required from the, um, from the professional sphere. And I don't feel as comfortable pushing that line. So I would try to put in efforts in getting one from a, from somebody in the industry. And was there an, another question? No, I think, I think on the same one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's right keep going. Um, the other question is, can the cost of nine months mentioned on the I-20 work as the backup for showing the cost of attendance for two years master's? Hmm. That's a good question, honestly. Um, since you already have your I-20 that already has the uh, amount mentioned on it, I think that may work, to be honest. But at the same time, you know, if you already have your I-20, so that's like one proof that you have for funding, the required funding. Uh, in the meantime, you can just send out an email to your university because you still have, I think, seven seven days or six days. Um, in the meantime, just send out an email asking them, hey, I need a breakdown of the requirement that should be stamped and signed or whatever. Um, and you can just print that PDF. That will be your proof. So you, you even now, like you have a proof already in hand, I just recommend just send out an email because it needs to be an official university cost estimate, which I think I-20 is an official cost estimate as well. Um, but yeah, like in my case, I had asked my department, um, hey guys, I'm applying for a scholarship. I need an official um, cost breakdown for living as well as, um, and, uh, for living as well as the uh, tuition fees. Make sure to go get both on the PDF, like living as well as, because generally they will just send over the tuition fees, tell them tuition fees and uh, living expenses. So you already have your I-20, great. But if that, if you don't hear back from your university, send your I-20, if you do, rather use your university's letterhead um, over your I-20. Amazing. Another quick question is, do the LORs need to be sent across in seal envelopes? Yes, that's a trick. <laughs> that extends the uh, whole process a bit because um, your professor or whoever is recommending you, they need to send over a physical um, LOR rather than send it over email, right? Um, so yes, it has to be sealed. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, uh, another question is, while filling my form, I've, as I've not applied for the loan, the, the total amount I'll be requesting is roughly 60,000 USD. Is that okay? I will apply for a loan in April once I receive official uh, an official fee statement from college. 
um can you provide some information on this can i update the local office by email once i receive the official fee structure from the university and then change the amount requested uh let's see i kind of had myself in the same shoes honestly well not exactly I, what i i already had my offer i knew what the amount was going to be like how much i, I i'm going to required to pay for for funding um i had asked a higher amount i think it was along the lines of 60k probably for two years i would recommend if you are really really confident in your profile um enter a higher number but don't but also like think about that's probably gonna work against you um what had happened in my case i'm, I'm not sure if you were here but i talked about that I had asked for a higher amount from the scholarship. Sorry, just a second. My alarm. Did... All right. Um, so I had asked for a higher amount for my scholarship, um, but I, as I was shortlisted for the second intro, for the second round, um, they asked me to revise because they did say that the lesser amount I ask, the better my chances are. Um, so I'm gonna let you take the decision on this one. Um, it is definitely possible to alter the the amount that you require from the from the um, from the scholarship. Um, now that I think about it a bit more, on the scholarship, uh, Ms. Ba, can we open up the um, the funding, the the financial form, the need analysis form? Yeah. So. If you look at uh, look here, uh, like in uh, in the second uh, part of the table, which talks about expected funds. So I guess in your case, if you are saying that you you probably will apply for a loan, which is expected, right? So you should fill that in here, lower the amount. I mean, if you're really sure that you're going to anyway apply for the loan, why not enter the amount here um, rather than you know maybe risking the chance of getting selected. So yeah, I think um, I'm not, I'm just gonna give you two options. One, yes, go ahead, enter the higher amount, but then this is also gonna be working against you because higher the amount, the lesser the chances. The other option is, if you are anyway gonna be applying for the loan, enter the loan amount here and overall lower the amount that you're asking from the scholarship committee. Yeah, that will be my take on this. That's really helpful. I did see a raised hand. Uh, it's not there anymore. So if you want to ask your question now, I think, Sarah. Um, but if not, then I'll go back to the chat. Uh, I just want to flag one thing that has been put in chat is that the deadline for the e-form distribution is today 6 p.m ist so for those who are in india the deadline to receive the e-form is today so make sure that you uh, request that form uh, if you haven't already okay i think we've answered most of the session uh, the questions um so the, the session is being recorded and we'll upload the recording on our um, YouTube channel. I'll just send a link for that in uh, in a second. Um, okay, so is there a, uh, another question? Is there any deadline for the professors to send the LOR by courier since that might take slightly longer? Oh, um, the professors do not have to send their LORs to the office. They need to send the LORs to you. You get the sealed envelope, get all your documents, and then that's gonna be like one single package that goes out. So that's gonna make it longer, I would assume. Um, but yeah, that's the case here. I think I went through this pretty fast. I'm gonna just repeat myself. So the professor uh, and whoever is recommending you, they will send their sealed LORs over to you. You will compile all your documents and your sealed LORs together in one package. And that one package is gonna be sent over to the local office. They're not gonna be separate. It's gonna be a single package. Okay, 
Yes, I think uh, that is clear. Um, um, Nishita, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Hi. Thank you. I hope I'm not repeating myself. So my question was that I'm currently in the final year of my graduation, undergraduation. Would I still be eligible to uh, apply since it's been mentioned on the website also that I need to have my degree in hand? Uh, hi, Nishita. Yeah, unfortunately, you will not be able to apply since one of the key requirements is that you need to have your bachelor's degree in hand. Um, so I guess that's one um, that's a really a hard criteria that they have put forward that um, eliminates a lot of the students, unfortunately. But if you are still around and want to apply next year, that's when you can be eligible to apply. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Mehnaz, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask about it's really possible um, that the professors send their LORs on the letterhead to me uh, via email and I print it out and then I put it in the seat and envelope or do they have to send it by courier to me? I'm, I'm quite lost at it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a tricky one, honestly. I mean, it, it, it is possible. Some people can do it. I mean, it's like bending the rules, honestly, a bit, but don't quote me on this. Well, it's recorded, so I mean, you guys have all the proof here. Um, let's see, what do I want to say here? Ideally, you would want the the LOR to be sealed, um, and the professor sends that sealed envelope to you, as I said earlier. Um, but clearly, that's going to take more time. So, what else? What else can you do? Maybe they send over um, send over their LOR to you, an email. You print it out. You seal it. But in order to be considered a sealed LOR, you generally have your professor stamp, like right where you have, you know, right where the envelope flap closes. They mm -hmm. either stamp or sign over that um, uh, that particular um, that edge, so they would know whether or not this has been opened. So if you are some somehow able to get your <laughs> professor's stamp and seal. <laughs> I don't see how that's going to happen. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. I also wanted to, um, I, I guess I'm repeating myself, but I also wanted to sort of understand the additional um, documents that I could prov uh, provide um, to sort of support my need for the scholarship. Um, I, I'm sure you've spoken about it, but I kind of missed it the last time. So if you could please repeat it. Uh, so I think. All the documents are um, that are required are already mentioned in the form itself. But yeah, maybe um, we can share the screen again, Ms. for a second here to talk about like the supporting documents. So um, you fill out all your form, uh, like 60 or 70 questions. Uh, and then you also send these supporting documents, right? You basically, you know, it's going to be your university letter. Um, your university offer letter, your um, uh, cost estimate, your um, GRE and TOEFL scores and ALS scores, probably any external funding that you have received and your LORs. So all of this, uh, so that's why I even have <clears throat> the three LORs mentioned here, right? Um, so all of this is a part of single package. So the LORs you know, are a package here, you know, are a part of the package here and uh, you need to send them over. Um, anything else that's here is, already mentioned in the form. So you should find these once you have, you know, your form. Oh, uh, um, uh, not this. I was, kind of, I was actually inquiring about, um, specifically to the funding, um, like, uh, um, I think there's line mentioned on the website where you need to sort of, um, show them proof that you do not have maybe other sources of funding or, so something like that, if there are any documents that could be helpful, because I've been thinking about what documents mm. could I provide them in regard uh, to I think that's, got it. Uh, let's go to slide number 21. <laughs> Sorry. So I think slide number 21 talks, basically uh, lets them know your financial situation. Um, so 
Uh, let's see. I think this is another one. Uh, there is a table which I have not included here, which talks about um, the income and expenses. So if you're filling out that particular form, um, that particular table, you know, you can mention your income of your parents probably who are earning. Um, so you would obviously have to provide a proof of the income, right? You cannot lie there. You cannot say my parents only make, you know, 10,000 rupees or um, whatever per month. It's gonna be something that, that needs to be backed up by actual documents, right? So you fill in the numbers that you cannot change first. Um, that's gonna be your parents' income, most likely, right? And anything else that's gonna be an income, they will probably not ask for proofs for those incomes. Let me open up my form in the, on the side so I can better answer your question um, as to what all you can include in that form. Okay. All right, so, um, right. So um, this talks about your annual income and your total expenses. So I think that's one uh, area where you can just straight away tell them, hey, this is my expense and this is my income. And we are not really saving a whole lot. If you can prove that your expenses are almost right there with regards to your income. Um, so that that's one way where you can explain you don't have a whole lot of um, extra funds going towards your education. And that's where you can show that you have a financial need. You don't necessarily have to show um, exorbitant documents like showing, God forbid, you have a certain situation, then that, that's why you're applying for a scholarship. Um, if that's the case, you can add those, but you don't, you don't really have to go and create situations which are not really there. I would recommend you know, filling out your parents' income um, and if you, if at all you have any income from assets, uh, they don't really ask questions on that. So what all they ask is, what is your parents' income? So I think if you only enter your parents' income as your income source and everything else is zero, and then um, in the expenses side, you can include all the expenses that you can think of. Um, and I, can, I think like one expense that people I think overlook is medical expenses somebody's parents are sick, maybe you can include like monthly, it's a couple of thousand rupees per month times 12 months, that, that adds more expenses to your, uh, to your list. So basically what you're trying to look at is trying to minimize uh, the surplus um, that you have after you deduct your expenses. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I would not go so far ahead to uh, like create um, situations like we have certain situation which may or may not be true so just state truthful with regards to like the income that you have state your parents income and on the expenses you can you know kind of be hand aviation or fill in some numbers here and there to kind of minimize that saving um okay thank you so much your question, yeah thank you thank you so much Great. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions in chat. If um, if there's any question that you put in chat and I wasn't able to ask and you still have a doubt, please um, put your questions in chat again or raise your hand and you can ask the question. Um, we are uh, way past our um, schedule time. Um, so, um, so we will end the session soon. I'll just ask one last question unless... Anything else comes up, uh, which is what instructions should we provide to our referees when they're writing the uh, letter of recommendation? All right, my experience with uh, referees is uh, they are busy, honestly, and you tell them they're probably gonna get, uh, they're probably gonna forget for some time and then you kind of reach back to them and given that you don't have a whole lot of time left, I would recommend like be really uh, clear with them that, hey, I'm applying for a scholarship, but at the same time, I only have like these many days left. Would you rather prefer, again, this is not recommended, would you rather prefer that I send you a draft of my LOR and you edit the LOR for your requirement 
And that's one way to expedite the process. I don't know how, uh, you know, there's different ways that professors take it. Some would be fine with it and some, you know, may, may take some offense to it. But if you like are really clear with them, it could be like a two part email. First part is, hey, professor, I'm applying for the scholarship. The deadline is in a week. Um, would you be kind enough to, you know, recommend me? And um, given the, the lack of time, would it be fine if I send over a draft? Don't send over a draft in the first one. Just ask if it's fine for you to send over a draft. If he's fine with it, you know, lo and behold, you can easily send them your uh, draft. That'll expedite your process uh, a bit. And I think that's that's the way to go here. Um, yeah, I, I, we also um, have like a guidance on our website on just LOR. So if it, if it helps, just go over that um, as, as well. Um, uh, Liston, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the session. That was, that was very helpful. Uh, so I had a question uh, regarding the funding, uh, like our asked earlier, Ricard asked for 60k funding per year, which is too much, as you said. Uh, so uh, I think uh, you mentioned that, that they asked you to lower uh, the amount requested. Uh, how much would be an ideal uh, uh, fund to be asked uh, per year or for the total? Um, again, honestly, I can't tell because I entered a number, I got selected. I wasn't sure if it was, if I lowballed myself a bit too much, um, but I can tell you what I got selected for. So I got selected for like 26K for two years. I think I probably could have gone higher. Um, so I would say like somewhere between 15K to 20K a year might be a number, but at the same time, see, you are asking them a certain number. At the same time, they will probably assess if it's worth it, right? If somebody is going to say MIT, I think it makes sense. 40K makes sense there, right? So you have like consider, um, it's not just the amount, it's also like, what kind of opportunity are they helping you avail after the, you get the scholarship? So yeah, I guess somewhere between 15 to 20K a year should be a good amount. And there's other aspects as well that would make it less or more favorable. Like what's the university? Um, is it more reputable? What are your, what are your scores in, you know, your um, different standardized tests? How is your SOP? How convincing is your SOP? So all these things also like help sell the number that you put in, in your application. Okay. Uh, so I kind of have a very specific question, uh, uh, very specific to me. Is it possible that I could mail it to someone uh, after the session? I reach out to you or something like that to me. Will that be possible? Uh, yeah, you can get get in touch with me as well on LinkedIn. I think um, <laughs> I don't know if you uh, um, have my LinkedIn, but I can you know post it in the chat or somewhere, and no, we can yeah. you know get in touch. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's three more questions that have come up for Hanam. Really yeah, sure, no. uh, yeah, let's go ahead with those. I know it's it's been a while that we're on this call. So, um, uh, so these are going to be the last set of questions that we'll take. Um, a lot of them have been uh, um, addressed uh, in, in the session through the PPT. So, Please, um, please have a look at the recording that'll be uploaded by the end of today or tomorrow. Um, so, uh, I'm I'm just gonna ask all of them together. Um, is the total disperse disbursement amount after graduation considered as fifty percent loan and fifty percent grant? Um, uh, Relatedly, about the university and scholarship and bank loan covering 50% of the cost, would this support my application considering they want a minimum amount requirement to be quoted? 
Um, uh, the first question, uh, yes, it's a 50% scholarship, 50% uh, loan. And what was the second question again? I have a university scholarship and a bank loan card, 50% uh, so, Oh yeah, definitely. Um, Shahbaz Khan, uh, so since you already have secured alternate funding sources, that's gonna definitely like put you up there because uh, yeah, you're, you'll be asking lesser, lesser from the uh, scholarship committee. And also what that tells is that you already went through some sort of screening process for that different scholarship or the university saw something in you and that's why they awarded you that scholarship, right? So it's already telling me that, hey, if that guy got scholarship, that means he is, you know, he is probably worth this scholarship as well. And they, then they will obviously look into your full application, but yeah, it's definitely gonna help your case. Um, Burhan, I think you sent your LinkedIn to me as a direct message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of the intent. I wasn't sure like okay, if shared out there um, or. Okay. okay, got it. Um, great. I will uh, note it down. If you want to be connected to Burhan on his LinkedIn, just send an email to info at project at uaccess.com and then we'll share the link with you. If you're a mentee with us, then email the programs team. Uh, I think Omar Rathra has a pretty unique question. Yeah. Uh, one year in Denmark and one year in the UK. Honestly, haven't been in this situation, so I can't, I can't say from experience. Um, um, but a question is, if your university is, if the, if the degree that you're getting is probably from Denmark, or if your offer letter is from Denmark, how would they know that your second year is going to be in the UK? Um, so what I'm basically getting at is, if your offer letter is from the university that's in Denmark, you put that on your application. If there is no need to mention that your second year is going to be in UK, I think it should not be a problem. But then again, maybe connect with the Aga Khan office, ask them this question. <coughs> I think it's either they're, they're going to say no, or you don't ask and then just straight away apply and say, I'm, I'm just going to be studying in Denmark because that's where your offer letter is probably from. So I guess in either case, you're, you're, they will let you know if you apply. So yeah, I think, I think you should like rather just apply. It, um, cool. Any other questions? I think I'm not... I think we've already addressed this question about um, changing the university after you've made the application. Um, you can have a look at the recording. We've addressed this in detail. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. I'm going to send a few links in chat again, um, just for those of you who might have missed it. Um, this is for our YouTube channel, which is where we'll be uploading a recording of this workshop. Um, if you have any questions and you are not a mentee with us, then you can email us at um, info at project .com. So I'm sending a link for that as well. And third, as I mentioned, we've developed a few resources that might help you in drafting your SOP um, your personal statement or the uh, or give you some guidance on the LORs. So you can have a look at that as well. It's on our website and I'm sending a link for that as well. So um, these are um, some things that might be helpful if, um, again, as we mentioned, the deadline for the scholarship is um, at the end of this month, which is 31st March. Um, so if you haven't already started, haven't started, um, please do now and request the application form um, um, on the website and then you can, um, then you'll have to send it by post. So have everything ready um, in advance. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Burhan, for staking on for so long, for being so patient with all the questions and for giving such a comprehensive presentation. Uh, we really appreciate that you took the time out for us. Yeah, thank you guys as well. I mean, uh, thank you for getting in touch with me. And I think, it, I hope it's helpful for all the applicants uh, and everybody who attended. Um, FYI, I have, so we're ending in 10 minutes, so I better get going. 
it was uh, great being here and um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm so sorry All for right. being on for so long. No worries. All thank good. You, All right, All take good. care, guys. See ya. Bye-bye.